Winterfell is a very mysterious place, from the bone-white tree with the blood-red hands for leaves that broods over an icy cold pool that doesn't seem to have a bottom, to the fact that there are apparently hot springs being pumped up through all of the walls, keeping this castle nice and warm in the icy north even through the long, years-long winters. The tree at the heart of the godswood is said to be older than the castle itself and saw the stone walls rise around it. The castle itself is compared to an old tree, a stone tree with roots that run deep into the earth. And they do. The crypts of Winterfell run incredibly deep into the earth, and one of the central mysteries that has bothered the fandom is what exactly is going on down in the crypts that is going to be so important to the end game because we all know that something is going on down there. Now, if this is your first time on my channel, don't worry, there will be a playlist at the end to get you caught up, but for those of you who are familiar, you will notice some things that stand out right away when I cover some of these old mysteries that bothered me when I first began to read this series, because we have speculated that the wall was built by Weirwoods pumping water from underground up into the wall where it can freeze, and therefore that's how the wall is constantly able to rebuild itself. Well, suddenly, when you have Winterfell then being compared constantly to a great stone tree, Catelyn literally says the tree saw the stone walls rise around it, hinting that there may be like roots of this tree running through the walls, further hinted at by the fact that there are hallways within Winterfell which are slanted so you can't even tell which floor you're on, and they twist in weird, strange ways. Um, they, they seem like they're following tree roots that were already there, right? Like, if you imagine that this big castle, if Bran the Builder, who built the wall by growing trees in special ways, right? Bran the Builder's, like, growing roots of this tree that's connected down to these hot springs up all the way through these walls they're twisting and running along with this root system and that is how you build winterfell around these roots so that warm water pumps through it that's basically in my opinion the most likely way that george has this set up it's similar to the wall but instead of ice surrounding it with this cold freezing mechanism you have the warm water being pumped through the stone to heat it surrounded by the icy cold north Basically, trees inside of walls pumping water seems to be Bran the Builder's preferred magical mechanism of construction and temperature control. And the logic of it really all seems to track pretty solidly for me, right? If we're having these trees be good at pumping water, which is what trees are really good at, and if you could manage to magically control where and how these trees grow, and you could get the roots to run the way you want them to, roughly. I mean, they maybe are still a little more twisted than you would like, which is why the hallways sometimes follow root systems like shapes, right, rather than hallway-like shapes. Um, you get this sort of, like, grown, but then also managed castle, sort of like a managed tree, like those people who, like, trim their hedges in very specific shapes. That's basically how I imagine Bran the Builder doing a lot of his foundational work, and then he builds the castle of Winterfell all around it, and then suddenly, boom, you have water pumping through the walls of Winterfell, and that seems a lot more likely than any sort of actual mechanical pump system that I could imagine, but um, if you have any evidence in the books that would go against that, I suppose definitely point it out in the comments, but from what I can remember, everything seems to track pretty well with this idea of roots running through the walls pumping this water. But the question is then, in my mind, why is there cold water pumped up into the wall and yet it is warm at Winterfell, right? Because the pool outside the weirwood tree at Winterfell is icy cold, right? It's a cold black pool with potentially no bottom, but it's not warm. It's not like a hot spring. But it's said that there are hot springs under Winterfell or at least that's the assumption as to how this water is warm that's pumped through there. So let's quickly talk about a couple of the main explanations for how these hot springs have formed, starting with the boring conventional scientific explanation that there is some sort of volcano or magma underneath Winterfell that happens to just be heating up the hot springs like a normal hot springs would be heated up in real life. 
But, like, come on, guys, it's fantasy. It's got to be a little bit more fun than that, right? Like, surely George has something going on with this weird, magical hot water that's being pumped through this castle. So, then people's minds wander to the next most logical explanation for this world and everything as we know it, right? Which is a dragon underneath Winterfell of some sort. And there is some actual pretty hard evidence in the books that is honestly kind of difficult to rule against like firmly and here's what it is when Bran and Rickon are down in the crypts of Winterfell and the place has just been burned and sacked and they're just hiding there waiting to make their escape Bran is warging and looking at everything through Summer's vision everything is being described in wolf-like terminology right like I believe he describes the towers that are on fire as something like the stone man cliffs are burning or something like that, right? And when he goes down into the crypts as Summer's vision, he describes it as like going down into the stone cave that men built or something like that. And then he's descending deeper and deeper. And then it switches back to being in Bran's point of view instead of Summer's. And then the wolves show up and that just shows like, yep, that was... Summer approaching Winterfell as it is burning and in ruins and then going down into the crypts where the wolves are able to then meet up with Bran and Rickon and eventually they are able to all go on their escape path. Now that would all be very good except for the fact that as Summer is very clearly approaching Winterfell, seeing the snow fall like ash, seeing everything in ruins, this happens. Smoke gets in Summer's eyes and then... What is in the sky is described as a great winged snake that's roar was a river of fire, and then Summer bears its teeth, and the snake was gone. So there are very clearly two different ways you can take this. This is Summer's mind playing a trick on them, right? This is like when you think you see something out of the corner of your eye, but then it was just your brain like doing the autocomplete wrong for a split second, and you blink and it's gone. And it was actually just like smoke rising and fire pouring out of these collapsing towers that have been described, right? Or, this is literally Summer seeing a dragon flying overhead and by the time they can even growl at it, it's just gone, right? This dragon is just taken off out of Winterfell, breathing fire as it goes. And it's a very literal description, right? Like there is absolutely zero doubt in my mind that summer sees a dragon above winterfell for a second the only doubt in my mind is whether or not it was a real dragon or whether or not it was the smoke in the eyes and then the brain playing a trick and maybe some sort of brand consciousness in there who knows what dragons are implying like making summer imagine a dragon for just a split second in this chaotic scene I don't know, maybe there's something to it that way, maybe that's how it wasn't a real dragon. But in any case, there's a good case to be made that Summer sees a dragon above Winterfell, which is pretty, you know, weird. Now, you could look at what we have talked about recently on the channel, in addition to the fact that there was apparently, at least for a split second, what looked to be a dragon taking off out of Winterfell and say, well, hey... There was probably a dragon down in the crypts of Winterfell bound to this tree in the same way that there are others, or people rather, who have created the others by being bound to these trees. There are people bound to the trees for a cold source up in the wall. What if there was a dragon bound below Winterfell as the heat source and then it escaped when everything was destroyed, right? And that would work pretty well, other than the fact that the crypts are where Bran and Rickon are hiding at that point, and there's been no damage to them, right? If this thing was down below Winterfell, one would think that they would have noticed it, like, leaving, or there would have had to have been damage to, like, the underground infrastructure where this thing would have likely been, you know, trapped and kept deep down in the roots, so I don't actually think that this was a dragon escaping Winterfell that was the heat source. But I do think George may have planted the seed as just a little way in case he needed another dragon or in case he wanted to go that route in the future. He's definitely given himself the opportunity to do that. 
by having this described the way it was when Summer sees a winged snake with a roar of fire. But as I said, logistically, I just have the problem of, well, if the thing was down below Winterfell, it was not in a place that would have been damaged where it could have escaped. It would have had to have literally been like living in the walls somehow and gotten out. And if it was any deeper than the crypts, which is where Bran and Rickon were, they would have probably had to have noticed it because it would have had to have gone up through the, you know, ruins of the crypts, which it didn't do. So I don't think a dragon from below Winterfell escaped. And another reason for thinking that is just also because, well, I don't think that George really wants another random dragon roaming around in the story. If he did need one, I guess he's got the seed planted for one, but I really don't think that that's a route he needs to go or is going to go. So I come down on, it is hard to, as I said, debunk the idea that Summer saw a dragon above Winterfell, but I really do think that that was the mind playing a trick, and that is probably the explanation that will be the most likely when the story reaches its end, because I don't think we're going to see that dragon popping up anywhere anytime soon. Also very worth noting that the way George does this sort of foreshadowing, if we were going to see that dragon popping up again soon, we would have probably heard at least one or two other mentions of it. We have had multiple books since that vision, and there has been no rumors of a new dragon that has been spotted anywhere else in the story, so I really think we can put to bed the idea that there is now just randomly a free dragon that escaped from under Winterfell, and that that was the original heat source for the hot water. So I think we have reached a point where it's a reasonable thing to suspect that it is in fact a tree that is pumping the warm water through the walls of Winterfell, and that in terms of a heat source, a natural hot spring caused by natural reasons is plausible but boring. A dragon being bound to the tree deep below the earth somehow, in the same way that we see potentially people bound to it in the walls, is possible, but also has a few problems if we're using the dragon that Summer saw as evidence for it. But it is, in a, in a way, I guess, very possible that there is still just a dragon deep below the earth that we have not seen yet, and maybe this vision of a dragon was just foreshadowing that, right? I do want to say it is entirely plausible that there is a dragon bound in the same way to the roots of this tree. But I think I have an explanation that I actually do like even a little bit better. And it relates directly to something that we've been talking about for several of the recent videos on this channel. That's right, it's not over yet. We are still in the middle of our Glass Candle mini-series. Because I think it is possible that the heat source bound to the roots of these trees deep within the crypts of Winterfell that will have to be discovered by our heroes is not a dragon. It is the glass candles that the people strapped to the trees within the wall are bound to. Just think about all of the puzzle pieces that we have in this giant, magical world-building setup that was laid down after the pact and in the battle with the Night's King was tested and managed to hold strong, and then the wall was built, or rebuilt rather, and then... The Starks are the power center of it all. Winterfell is the power center of it all. The Starks hold all of this power. There are only Starks allowed down into the crypts. And as I said in the video where I talked about the ritual to make the others, if these people in the wall are bound to glass candles and you want this wall to be a very strong power source, it would make a lot of sense to put those glass candles somewhere else, somewhere far away, somewhere well-guarded. Where is more well-guarded than the familial crypts of the depths of Winterfell? Within these tree roots, in the most secure, magically protected castle, and most stone-fortified castle in all of the north, right? This is the place. This is where you would store the center of power for your giant magical blood sacrifice system that keeps your family in power. You would hide all of the glass candles that keep the power source alive deep down under your castle. And that's where all of the heat comes from. These hundreds and hundreds of ever-burning candles, which are likely embedded in the roots of the trees which pump the water. Given everything that we have talked about, it's just perfect on so many levels. Of course you would put the glass candles 
deep down there. And if they need to be renewed with blood every once in a while, as is suspected, obviously you put them in the roots of this giant tree system, which is constantly being fed blood. And if all of the weirwoods are connected, right, which I believe that they are, all of these roots interconnect. That means that the people who are bound to the wall and the glass candles they are bound to are connected by this hundreds of mile long root network that goes everywhere underground in Westeros and all of the blood that is being sacrificed to the weirwoods is constantly going to renewing those glass candle bonds and that is what's keeping the wall warded, keeping the ice magic going, keeping the trees pumping their water, keeping those people alive. The whole magical power system seems to be centered around Winterfell because of course it is, because that's the heart of our story, the wall and Winterfell. And those are the two cruxes of power, right? That's where all of this magic is taking place. I think the bodies are in the wall. I think the glass candles are in the roots of the trees down below Winterfell, which is why you see the wall freezing with all of the cold, icy, other magic that we see done in the television show when the weirwood spirit is merged with the human consciousness. And then meanwhile, down in the crypts, you have this heat source that is constantly sitting there providing heat deep underground, which is then being pumped up through the very roots that these glass candles could be embedded in. And that is why you get the warm water pumping through Winterfell. The whole magical system all works together. Everything just fits perfectly like a giant puzzle that all just dominoes together and does the temperature control in the way that would really kind of make sense for everything George has lined up. And there is even more interesting things to discuss in regards to some things we've talked about, because if guest right was what the Night's King was trying to use in some way when he was quote-unquote sacrificing to the others, if the others potentially follow guest right, and if that is a way around the system that was attempted to be used in the past, well then it's very interesting that we see these Stark King statues sitting in the pose with the iron sword across their lap that is used traditionally to deny guest right. So they are saying, no, guest right does not apply here. If you come for these glass candles, if you come for this power source, you will find no mercy here. There's no way around this. You are going to have to fight us. You will have to fight the dead Starks. You will have to fight these statues because all of Winterfell is trying to protect its power source. Now, another thing that we have recently discussed is the fact that Arya will very likely be set up by the Faceless Men to be the perfect person to know how to put out a glass candle. It seems very likely that the Faceless Men, who say all men must die, would be the people who went around in Old Valyria putting out glass candles to give the gift of death to the slaves who were praying for it because they could not die naturally because they were bound to these glass candles. So the gift of death is probably very directly related, at least originally, to putting out glass candles, and they will probably teach Arya how to do that before she leaves Bravos. So in my personal headcanon, the way that it should go is that she should go from Bravos to King's Landing, use her knowledge of the Red Keep to go down into the depths of the Red Keep to put out the candle that the mountain is bound to because she is the perfect person to figure that out. But there is another way that I do just want to quickly drop in here because I think it would be also hilarious is if she can warg cats, right? If she wargs into, say, Sir Pounce or Balerion, the black cat that's super old and lives down in the tunnels in the Red Keep, and then she knows how to navigate the tunnels of the Red Keep and she goes and during Clegane Bowl or whenever she needs to kill the mountain, right? She finds this glass candle in cat form and knocks it over, that would be hilarious. Like, she's just knocking Kyburn's stuff off of his desk while he's gone, messing up his work, and she kills the mountain by knocking over these glass candles like a cat would. That would be, in my opinion, like, the top probably funniest way I've ever imagined the mountain could die is if it's Arya in Sir Pounce knocking off stuff off Kyburn's desk. It would, it would be amazing. But if she does not do that, if she actually goes south to King's Landing, her going down into the Red Keep to put out the mountain's glass candle would be a very George R. R. Martin way of introducing us to this idea where it's like, 
He hasn't even revealed yet that there are glass candles involved in the construction of the wall. We think, oh, Arya has learned to put out glass candles. The whole point is so that she can go and kill the mountain. Oh, there's this big dramatic moment where she does put out the glass candle and kill the mountain. Okay, that's all paid off. Arya's whole thing is done. Only for the characters then in the north to be trying to kill these people who are bound to these trees that they have just discovered to their horror to find out that no, they cannot die because they are somehow bound to these glass candles. So then it's Arya needing to get north and them all needing to find where the heck these glass candles are and then Arya being there to be able to give them the knowledge they need to put them out while everyone else all just kind of has their own piece of this puzzle, right? Like danny has got the whole anti-crucifixion, anti-slavery thing going on. john has got the whole anti-otherization, the wall is kind of a problem thing going on. Bran's got the whole, like, God's eye view of literally everything going on. arya has got the whole putting out glass candles, undying ones are bad. All of it's just merging together, and they all need to meet up, centered around the problem, and it would be very convenient for wrapping these books up if that central problem happened to be a bunch of glass candles deep in the crypts of Winterfell. So, okay, Arya may need to give them the knowledge to put out these glass candles, and if that is the case, then on some level it does really kind of make sense why she would have been the one chosen to stab the Night King in the television show, right? If she's the one coming in with the knowledge to kill the others as her role in this situation, that's like, you know, it, it, it makes sense. And in the show, the reason it doesn't make any sense is because they didn't do any of the magical setup that was required to make it make sense. But in this canon, headcanon thing that I'm trying to build here, trying to figure out how this could play out, it actually kind of could really work pretty well. And you could see why they would have made that choice during season eight, if you follow me. But there is so much foreshadowing of these statues coming to life, right? These statues that are denying guest right. And if these statues are as it would make sense for them to be, there to protect the power source of House Stark, which again seems to be the Wall, and the Others, and the sacrifice to the Weirwoods, and this whole magical bloodline power system that gives their family power. All of it, if it's centered around there, they would definitely be protecting that. So, if they're denying guest right, which was a potential solution to the problem, and they're going to potentially be able to come alive to defend the crypts and defend whatever's down there, how do you get past this army of giant stone statues that are going to try and kill you if you get near these glass candles? Well, there are really a couple of people that you could see getting through down past these guys and getting to the glass candles. One of them is potentially Arya, for the same reasons that she is prepared to navigate below the Red Keep. All of that could be paid off by her navigating the darkness of the crypts below Winterfell, sneaking past these statues who would kill her, and then trying to get to the glass candles and put them out. But the other solution that's really interesting, who would the statues of these dead Starks who are there to guard the crypts, who would they allow to come down into the crypts unharmed? In my mind, only a dead Stark. Well, just so happens we have a dead Stark in our story who has had constant dreams about needing to go down into the depths of the crypts. That's right, Jon Snow may need to go down into the depths of these crypts as a dead Stark, the only one who would be allowed to go past these statues unharmed, because that is his place, the place that he never felt welcomed, that is actually, genuinely, truly his place, because he is a true-born Stark Targaryen king who should be buried in those crypts. The statues will let him pass, and he will be able to go down there, potentially with Arya, potentially having to just take the knowledge he has gained from Arya, and he will go down there and be able to put out the glass candles that are deep below the crypts of Winterfell, stuck in these tree roots, drinking the blood, and also providing the heat to Winterfell while keeping the bodies in the wall forever bound to this eternal life. 
What do you think of all of that as a big, wrapped-up, intertwined, elegant solution for the mysteries of the Wall and Winterfell and the Crypts and what's going on with the others, all of it coming together as one? How do you feel about all of that? Let me know down in the comments. If you haven't subscribed, be sure to do so before you go, and I'll see you with something else very soon. Thank <laughs> you.